evening meeting, and my wife and Rick was a baby, and one other brother and his wife and little girl would come. They'd just be the five or six of us. And I used to think, you know, we could stay home. I'd drive 15 miles to get there to the country. We could stay home, save the gas, and not do this. And the brother, he says, no, you need to practice. We'll come. <laughs> <laughs> and he told me, he said, don't forget the angels are listening. So I'd envision a big host of angels coming to listen to this, this crazy twerp, what he got to say. It helped. <laughs> I preached a congregation one time of about, about 4,000 people. And I, as I stood on the platform before I got, went out to preach, I thought of that little room down there in Alabama thinking, you know, I bet there weren't this many angels listening that night. So it, it, it's nice to have people you can see. But when he says you made a spectacle, you're, you're made, you're made a, a spectacle is not just something somebody's watching, but they watch. Come here, look at this. <laughs> oh, what's happening? That's going to happen. Come to the great school of Bible meeting, you say, whoo, going to go out and win the world. Yeah, you're going to go out and be a spectacle of the world. That's what you're going to win. <laughs> okay. Then I'm going to need some courage. And the path to courage is understanding who you are and taking the truth of God's grace and preaching it, declaring it, letting it first live in you, and then what lives in you live, in, live, live through you. The key to that, there's a very simple key to it. It's not an easy key. It's easy for you and me in the sense it didn't cost us anything. But then it cost you everything. A picture of the ministry, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 3. Give none offense in anything that the ministry be not blamed. Don't be a stumbling block to others. Now, when it says give none offense, you know. I, we just, I just spent two sessions talking to you about being offensive. He's talking about you. Don't be a stumbling block to others that the ministry isn't blamed. That's, that's the big issue is the ministry. Be sure that the stories aren't true. Paul suffered, in my gospel, I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even under bonds. But the word of God is not bound. The story on the internet this morning is the apostle Paul landed in jail. Government wouldn't put you in jail if you weren't guilty, right? As an evildoer. But why was he really there? Preaching the gospel. But the culture thought preaching the gospel was an evil thing. Did you know we have an insurance policy on me in case I say the wrong thing on the television or the radio? What would the wrong thing be? Reading Romans chapter 1, verse 27, 28, 29. You know what I'm talking about. People that have the insurance on our church have said, you need to have an umbrella policy on Brother Jordan since you're out there. And it didn't have to be because I'm on the radio or the television. It could just be right here in the church building. That wasn't that way years, you know, 10, 15 years ago. It's the standard today. The culture's changed. The world's changed. The tipping point's changed. You need to understand that. The world you live in is not... The, the past is past. You need to look to the future. Live in the present. Look into the future you're going to live in, and it ain't going to be built on the... You remember we went through that stuff about the, about the seasons, the changing? We're, we're moving into the winter time. In fact, we're in the winter time. Springtime's going to be coming. New beginnings. A lot of difference. Be sure the stories are true for the right reason. But in all things, approving yourself, ourselves as the ministers of God, in patience, in afflictions, in necessities, in distresses, in stripes, in imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in watchings, in fastings. Those are the credentials. 
When you ask a guy for his credentials in the ministry, most of the time they want to know how many degree, how many letters you have after your name that don't spell words. <laughs> guy said, "This fellow's got more degrees and he's got temperature." Doesn't matter. They're the credentials. Here's the character: by pureness, by knowledge, by long suffering by kindness, by the Holy Ghost. That's where it comes from. By love unfeigned. You're not, you've got genuine love, not just love that you're, is put on. By the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left. Now verse 8, notice the contrast. By honor and dishonor, by evil report and good report. You understand, folks, your ministry is going to get mixed reviews. Somebody's going to like you and somebody ain't. I was teaching one time in a place and there were some people that just wouldn't come. They believed the doctrine. They just wouldn't come. And I couldn't understand it. And I was talking to a brother one day, and we were talking about it. Because they, used, they go to hear him. They drive over to hear him. And I said, you know, I really don't understand. that they, they believe the doctrine. He said, can I tell you what it is? I said, yeah. He said, they don't like you. How could that be? Sweet little old me? <laughs> yeah. And you know what I said? I said, oh. In the back of my mind, I thought, well, well that's good because I don't like them either. But I <laughs> No, I didn't think that. <laughs> but sometime your ministry is not going to get good reviews just because of that. By evil report, by good report, as deceivers yet true. They're going to think you are a deceiver and, you're tell yet, and yet you're telling the truth. As unknown and yet well known. That's one, that one gets me. You think that nobody knows what you're doing and yet your influence far outweighs the visible presence that you have in a, in a, in a world, in a community. As unknown and yet well known. This little church, we're sitting out here on a little piece of ground. We are, we are a bunch of nobodies in the scheme of things. And yet, people know about us all over. And you say, how in the world does that happen? Then you try to figure out how to make it happen. And that's when you lose the ball. Just go out there and preach the word. And let what happens, what happens. As dying, and yet we live. How you guys keep existing, I got no idea. I thought y'all be dead years ago. <laughs> there we are. As chastened, and not killed. Brother Dean out in Oregon. Assembly of God pastor, Pentecostal pastor. Comes to understand right division. Begins to teach his church the distinctive ministry of Paul. They leave Pentecostalism, come into grace, and almost immediately Dean gets sick. You know what his former associates are saying about him? That's God turns you over to the devil. You know what God's telling his church members? You know what the devil's saying to them in the back of their mind? That's God getting, 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 your, getting the preacher because of what you did. As chastened. And you know what Brother Dean does? He just said, I just thank God for His grace. And he just keeps on going. That can happen to you. In fact, that's happening to you right now. As sorrowful. And yet always rejoicing. You look so sad. <laughs> and yet there you are just 
rejoicing in the Lord. As poor. I don't know about the as there. Most of us are poor. Yet making many rich. Oh, that's spiritual issue he's talking about. Looks like you're lost. It looks like you don't have... You know, I, I was in a wedding just a few weeks ago, just not two weeks ago in a Catholic church. And I'm sitting there watching all of this. They have such theater. And you sit in this gorgeous building and it's humbling. It's easy to see how religion can seduce you. And I watch people that I know who have no, no regard for God, the things of God, spiritual things at all, get religious. And go take Jesus. I can sit with those people and try to talk to them about the gospel. They've got to leave the room. In fact, it's at the state now. I walk in the room and they leave before I talk to them. <laughs> I thought about that verse. Is having nothing. We don't have any religious theater. I tell people, don't do any of that stuff. Just trust Christ. And you'll possess everything. That doesn't appeal to save people. Oh, we want to belong to a church. We want to do something. You say, forget it. You already have everything in Christ. How do you guys exist? Oh, we possess everything. See the difference? That's what the ministry is really about. People want to be big fish in little ponds. That's the only place you can be a big fish. People want everybody to know their name. They're always going to be about six and a half, if not seven billion people on the planet that never heard your name. That's not the issue. The issue has been faithful where you are. I want to show you an illustration. Come back with me to the book of Exodus, chapter 2. You remember when Paul... 2 Corinthians 12, he says, Because of the abundance of the revelation, there's this thorn of the flesh given to me. And I prayed three times, Lord, take it away. And the Lord said to me, My grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in your <coughs> weakness. So if I want God's strength, where do I need to be? I need to be weak. Out of the way. And we started off reading the verse in the Corinthians about weakness. You're strong. We're weak. You're rich. We're poor. They thought they were. He was. We're fool for Christ. You're wise. That's that contrast. Paul said, most gladly, therefore, will I glory in my infirmities and my weaknesses that the power of Christ may rest on me. I think one of the most striking illustrations of that in the Old Testament, Moses. In Exodus chapter 2, Verse 12, and it came to pass in those days that Moses was grown. And he went out unto his brethren and looked on, on, his, on, on their burdens. And he spied an Egyptian smiting a Hebrew, one of his brethren. And he looked this way and that. And when he saw there was no man, he slew the Egyptian and hit him in the sand. Moses was a strong man. You ever thought about that? He's raised in Pharaoh's court, educated in the, in the wisdom of the Egyptians. But he was a man who could go live on the backside of the desert for 40 years and be a sheep herder. 
He was physically an impressive man. He was an outdoorsman. He was a, a shepherd. Here, you see his strength. He sees the Egyptian smiting the Hebrew. What does he do? He smites the Hebrew, uh, the Egyptian. He kills him. He demonstrates, I'm the strong man. How? By smiting him. And when Moses' strength, whack, I can show you I can get it done. But Moses had a weakness. Come over to chapter 4. Moses is aware he's strong. He looks both ways. Nobody's there to help. Boom, I'll do it. Whammo. He murderates the guy. Strong. But he's got a weakness. Chapter 4. Verse 11. Verse 10. Moses said unto the Lord, O oh my, oh my Lord, I am not eloquent. Neither therefore nor, nor since thou hast spoken unto, unto thy servant, but I am slow of speech and of, and, and of a slow tongue. Moses said, I got a weakness, Lord. I can't go and do this. I can't talk well. I'm strong. I can smite the Egyptian, but I'm weak. I can't speak your word. Now, you remember what I... You know where I'm going, don't you? You come with me over to Numbers chapter 20. For those of you who hadn't caught on yet. Last night when they had this, this box down here fixing to open this pulpit, about three seconds before they, they were undoing the box... It dawned on me what might be in the box. I didn't know. I looked at my wife and I said, if that's that pulpit, I'm going to be excited. <laughs> and she looked at me, and you shoreward people will appreciate this. My wife looked at me and she said, just as long as it's not Joe. <laughs> she was afraid Joe Wilkie was going to jump out of the box. Now, you don't know what that means, see, but we, we have a group of people here called the Shorewood Players, and we, they do skits and so, so forth, and Joe is our resident in drag. <laughs> and for some reason, my wife was afraid he was going to jump out like a, a queen out of a cake, and, and I don't know why, I was the more spiritual type. <laughs> Well, in number, just in case, see, she didn't catch on. In case you hadn't caught on to Moses, Numbers 20, verse number 7. Find a chapter here. The Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Take the rod and gather thou the assembly together, thou and Aaron thy brother, and do what? speak under the rock before their eyes, and it shall give forth water. So what did he do? He spoke, and it gave water. Well, he did the first time. Exodus 17. He spoke. He worked out of his weakness. And he got water. When Moses worked and lived out of what he said was my weakness, your strength gave us water. But what do you do here? Well, verse 9, Moses took the rod from before the Lord as he commanded. Moses and Aaron gathered the congregation together before the rock, and he said unto them, Hear, ye, hear now, ye rebels, must we fetch you water out of this rock? And Moses lifted up his hand with his rod, and he smote the rock. Twice. God said, speak. In your weakness, my strength is made perfect. Moses said, I'm going to go in my strength. And whack, whack. 
And that kept him out of the promised land. The sin that kept Moses from the promised land was using his strength instead of his weakness. God says to you, my strength is made perfect in your weakness. We have this treasure in an earthen vessel that the excellency of the power may be of him and not us. You don't seek help for your, for your strength. You do that yourself. You seek help for your weakness. The key to ministry is not all kind of trappings. I've seen people with keen minds to study Great elocutionary ability to speak. Great tenacity with work ethic. Fail miserably. Because they work out of those strengths. Go back with me to one verse and we'll quit. Second, First Timothy chapter 1. The key to ministry is for our strength, our, our weakness to be the source of our strength. His strength is made perfect in our weakness. That verse we were reading a minute ago, 1 Timothy chapter 1, go back to verse 5. Now the end of the commandment is charity. The ultimate experience of God's presence in your life is charity. The bond of perfection, the bond of perfectness, the bond of maturity. The thing, charity is the ability to value and esteem a thing the way God does. To have that divine viewpoint. Out of. A pure heart. That charity springs from a pure heart. And a good conscience. A clear, single-minded conscience. And a faith unfeigned. Charity that comes out of a pure heart, out of a clean conscience, and a life that's free from hypocrisy. An impure heart produces a guilty conscience that results in a phony life. Impurity. Guilt. Pretense. As opposed to purity, integrity, and sincerity. Charity is contaminated by an impure heart. It's confined by a guilty conscience. And it's counterfeited by a phony lifestyle. Proverbs said, Son, give me thy heart. It starts there. You see, for all the stuff you learn... It's never the head, it's the heart. And with the heart, man believes. I pray for you that we not just fill your head. I want to do that, no question. But I want it to purify your heart. That's what Christ has already done for you. That's who he has already made you. 
And that charity comes out of that pure heart that God gives you in Christ that produces a good conscience that produces a real, genuine life of faith in who you are in Him. Everything in your ministry starts and ends with you. Too often we worry about the other guy. Before we worry there, we have to focus here. And if you focus here, you'll find that you have something to minister there. Okay? I'm not trying to be heavy with you. It's still the middle of the day. The go home, sick them message is tomorrow at noon. But I'm trying to give you my advice about how to get through the difficult days. Brother Brian's going to talk after lunch about some things about the Bible text that you're going to want to know about. And after he's finished, if there's some time, I've got one more session I'd like to talk to you about. Just some things I know about how to get through trouble specifically. But listen, it's all just based upon, char upon charity out of a pure heart and a faith unfeigned. That's the goal. That's the end, the goal of the godly edifying that Paul says is our ministry. So we're not just playing around with, the, with what we do here. This is life and it's ministry. And I pray that you have that as the goal. Wherever you are in your studies, wherever you are in your edification process, understand that's the goal. If you're long in, in the tooth in ministry and you've been there, keep the vision. If you're just starting, get the vision and press toward the mark. I believe it's good to have a forward move. We ought to always be moving forward toward the goal, the prize for the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And I want you to go too. I mentioned last night that uh, Tom, when he gave the exhortation, especially there at the end, about you are our joy and our crown of rejoicing. It's good to have that. You look around you and you know that verse from Corinthians is true. You see your calling, brother, not many mighty, not many noble. But that's good that it has to be him. And I thank you personally for the privilege of having that opportunity to be that in a part of that in your life. Ray, are they ready for us to eat?